Hello, welcome and good afternoon. Um, my name is Sue Miller and I'm Professor of Music in Leeds School of Arts at Leeds Beckett University. We're really delighted to welcome Dr Mariana Lopez, uh, who in a moment will be formally introduced by my colleague Ben Mosley, Senior Lecturer in Audio Engineering at Leeds School of Arts. And just before I hand over to Ben, just a little bit of information about this speaking series. The mission of the prestigious Inside Out Lecture Series is to bring the best minds and thinkers of our generation to inspire and inform our staff and our students at Leeds School of Arts and also the wider public. So to this end, we're bringing you renowned speakers from around the globe in order to enhance the cultural life of our university and a wider audience through these online talks. So please note that subtitles are enabled for this event and can be accessed on the bottom right of the screen. Please note that your experience viewing these captions will vary depending on the connectivity at the time and your device. These captions are transcribed live and inaccuracies may occur. So um, we very much welcome as well your participation at the end of this talk in our end Q&A session via the questions which you can submit via Slido, which is www.slido.com with the code LBU-ML. So without further ado, let me pass over to my colleague Ben Mosley to introduce our speaker today, Dr Mariana Lopez. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I've been really fortunate to work with Mariana in the past and uh, I have the privilege of introducing her talk today. Dr. Mariana Lopez is a senior lecturer in sound production and post production in the Department of Theatre, Film, Television and Interactive Media at the University of York, where she's been working since 2016. She has a background in music, sound design and acoustics. Marianne is a principal investigator for the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded Enhancing Audio Description 2, implementing accessible, personalised and inclusive film and television experiences for visually impaired audiences. This project has just begun and it's uh, going to be probably the main focus of uh, today's talk. She was also the principal investigator for Enhancing Audio Description, which was the, uh, the first part of this research, also funded by the AHRC between 2016 and 2018. Anne has been involved in the British Academy funded project, The Soundscapes of the York Mystery Plays. She has also supervised Mary Sklodowska Curie Fellowships throughout the year. Uh, with topics including gaming and education, acoustic cultural heritage studies and natural acoustics. Mariana is also active in the film of sound design, having worked on a number of creative experiences. Uh, this talk today uh, has an abstract uh, that goes along the lines of this. Accessibility to film and television for visually impaired audiences has been traditionally provided through a method called audio description, often uh, abbreviated as AD. AD is a third person commentary which is added to a film and television production to describe the visual layer. But what if we could integrate accessibility to a creative production by harnessing the power of sound design? The enhanced audio description methods are an alternative to audio description in which a combination of sound effects, audio spatialization and first person narration is used to create accessible audio visual experiences. This talk will introduce participants to key concepts in the field of accessibility as well as introduce tangible ways in which creators can work on making accessible productions. The explorations and findings on how the EAD methods can provide personalised experiences to audiences while acting as a vehicle for social inclusion will also be explored. Uh, from my personal perspective, I was lucky enough to attend the uh, conference back in 2017, which was the culmination of the first enhanced audio description project. Uh, I found it very inspiring. One of the best events I've been to in terms of uh, quality of presentations and discussions. Uh, I also have some memories of some great cheese, um, which um, will make Mariana chuckle um, and shows you the importance of feeding your attendees well. Um, it's also worth noting that that conference was uh, was free. Uh, free to attend for all um, attendees, which is priced into the funding model, which is a really great way of kind of uh, engaging your your audience in your in your research projects. For me, the ability to apply our skills in audio music to improve accessibility in any area of life for those with physical impairments is a wonderful thing. TV and film is such an important part of modern life. The trip to the cinema for the latest blockbuster, the latest reality show and the box set binge have become important personal and shared experiences and important cultural reference points. 
And it's easy to forget that these experiences are not open to everyone. And there are many people who cannot engage in TV and film in the same way as the majority of the population are fortunate to be able to do so. And the potential for this research to make a real difference in improving accessibility and changing the way we approach sound for film and television is important and exciting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing the outcomes of this upcoming project. So enough for me, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Mariana Lopez for today's talk. Hi everyone, thank you so uh, much Ben for such, uh, such a lovely introduction and, and it's good to know that uh, the cheese at the event left such a, a long lasting impression in your experience and you'd pleased to know there is uh, an event planned for this project as well and now I feel like we should really uh, continue providing that high quality uh, cheese experience we did last time. <laughs> uh, I have to be honest I do not remember the cheese but uh, organizing an event is always uh, is always stressful so maybe I didn't get to eat any. Uh, but thank you so much um, to both Sue and Ben for inviting me uh, to this wonderful series of events uh, today and for offering such a wonderful and uh, warm uh, introduction. And a huge thanks to uh, the organising team that has been doing fantastic work behind the scenes to make sure everything uh, works uh, smoothly uh, and that there's captions provided. So thank you so much um, for uh, to, to, to everyone for your for your support and invitation. And thanks so much for joining uh, this talk today. Um, so as Ben indicated, I'll be talking about accessibility uh, for visually impaired film and television uh, audiences and how that can be combined with sound design to create um, creative approaches to accessibility. And what I'll be talking about today is um, the work we've been doing as part of our enhancing audio description projects that has been um, pointed out. There's two of them. One ended in 2018 and the other one started uh, November last year and it's a four year project and we're very uh, lucky and grateful for the fund to, to have we're lucky to have the funding and grateful to the Research Council, the AHSC for providing uh, the funding for our research. So what I'll do first is I'll tell you a little bit about what audio description is. So we have a next slide coming uh, coming through and audio description, uh, as Ed pointed out, is also abbreviated as AD. And you may be familiar with this concept, but I'll go through some of the uh, basics just that we're all so that we're all on the same page. So audio description is a third person variable commentary that is added to a film uh, or television production after they're completed to make them accessible for visually impaired people. What this means is that uh, aspects of the visual layer of a production are um, explained through this verbal commentary and also there are uh, sometimes descriptions of sound elements that are deemed by the describer to be difficult to um, to understand without a visual context and without an explanation. And that audio description um, can also be offered in other platforms such as um, art galleries and museums and theatre productions in a slightly different format. A few things to know about audio description is that the quotas and actually achievements of audio description on broadcasting and, and cinema are much lower than with other accessibility methods. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, the Quotas for audio description, um, according to the Ofcom report of 2019, are about 10%. Uh, some broadcasters are committed to uh, offering 20% of their programming. And the, actually, uh, the actual achievement ranges from 7% to 76. 76% being um, of the programming being with AD, that really high percentage is actually from E4. But on average, we're looking at 10 to 20 percent, which means that if you're lucky and the 20 percent that is described is what you'd like to watch, that is fantastic. If it isn't, you're probably not going to be able to access those productions. To contrast with this and give you a, a bit of a, of a benchmark, uh, subtitles have a much have much um, higher quotas that can reach 100% and achievements are around 35% to 100% of programming. And this difference between subtitling and audio description is something that actually um, visually impaired people mention quite a lot in, uh, in focus groups and others as um, a source of a, a challenge and something to over overcome. Um, 
so this is what audio description is in theory, but I would like you to experience what audio description is so that you get a better sense of what an audio described film uh, sounds like. So we're going to do what we're going to be doing is watching um, two videos today. Uh, both of them, we're going to watch three videos, but two of them are from the same film and they're the exact same extract. The film is a short film called Pearl that was directed by Hannah Palumbo and it's a student film that was done as part of the third year um, film group projects in the BSc in film and television production at York. And what we did uh, in our first part of the project uh, with the permission of the students, we redesigned the soundtrack of this film, but we also commissioned uh, an audio described version to be able to use for testing. So what we're going to be uh, watching now is the a very short section of the audio described uh, version of the film. So we could please play the video. Thank you. In the room, Oliver continues his medical examination and listens to Margaret's back with his stethoscope. He frowns and looks at Margaret in alarm. Oliver takes the stethoscope off and stands up. Cecily watches again. I'm going to get better, aren't I? You're a tough girl, Margaret. I think you'll be fine. Excuse me. Margaret stops Oliver and holds out her hand with a polished white pearl in her palm. Cecily comes in. When did you take this? It's all right. These are not to give away. A word, Miss Grimshaw. Now, please. Margaret watches as Cecily turns and walks out of the room with the pearl, followed by Oliver. The two of them stand by a fire in the gloomy hallway. I'll just take you through what's going to happen. You're going to go upstairs and pack Margaret a bag while I call an ambulance. I think not. Margaret doesn't want that and I'm not going to force her. So I hope you were able to, uh, to watch that example and that it gives you a sense of what audio description uh, sounds like. The uh, audio description for this film was provided by uh, Sensor Media. So what? Uh, moving on to the next slide, what are the challenges and ways forward for audio description. One of the challenges that uh, I've already hinted at is the lack of availability. Um, and Ben mentioned, uh, mentioned this very eloquently in his introduction, this, uh, this very important fact that if something isn't accessible, there is a very, very large number of people that are going to be prevented from watching their favorite show or the film everyone has been talking about and that could be because that doesn't fall within that 20 percent that is being described or because they have to choose a screening in a cinema that has audio description um, and uh, many times that those headsets in audio description in screenings with audio description don't even work so there is a there is a problem there of uh, needing to look into why there isn't uh, more availability and what needs to uh, be described. Another uh, challenge is that audio description as many accessibility methods is a method that is completely outside the creative process of making a film or television production. What this means is that a production is completely finished, completed and then is sent off to uh, an audio description company to produce the AD. And there is no connection within those two processes. And that could result in an audio described version of the film that is not at the same quality than the film. And it could also have a tone that doesn't match, match the production itself. And it could even have inaccuracies if uh, the uh, aim of the filmmakers hasn't been captured or the things, the items that have been chosen to be described maybe aren't the ones that uh, the creative team thinks the focus should have been. So there's another challenge there. Another really important one for me is that um, audio description, as many other accessibility methods, is a one fits all process. Um, visually impaired people, either use audio description or there is no other alternative. And that assumes that 
all visually impaired people will um, benefit from audio description in the same way and that will enjoy audio description in the same way and will like the same style of audio description. But this is, of course, not the case. And uh, differences in, in preferences are uh, linked to many different things. It could be um, different types of sight loss could result on different needs different experiences can result in different expectations. But very importantly as well, people do have different aesthetic preferences. I'm sure that we, if we ask the audience what their favourite type of film or TV programme or radio programme uh, is, we would all have different answers. And bringing diversity back into accessibility is um, at the core of uh, the Enhancing Audio Description project. Another issue is quality issues. Something I uh, hear a lot from visually impaired people when they talk about audio description is that the quality varies quite um, um, drastically from one programme or a production to the other. And this sometimes may put them off from watching and experiencing something. And the quality may have um, may not necessarily be a reflection on the quality of the production itself that they're watching. Um, Something that I've heard a few times from different uh, people, and they always um, people always recount this uh, in a funny way, is that apparently it's not unusual in nature documentaries for describers to not match the name of the animal to the right description of the animal, which uh, of course uh, causes a little bit of a problem when you're um, counting that description to uh, know uh, a little bit more about this animal. And generally these stories are, are recounted a bit in a, in, in a funny way, um, but when this happens too much, they turn into an access, uh, into an access uh, barrier and we all want to be able to enjoy those nature documentaries or any other productions. So how, what, what sort of solutions, what, for, what sort of ways forward can we take? And there's a few suggestions in the next uh, slide. One of the main things we're working on is personalising accessibility um, with the aim uh, of acknowledging diversity of preferences and needs and expectations by providing choice to end users, allowing end users to choose what form of accessibility works from them and that might well be that for a nature documentary a form of accessibility is preferred and a different one is preferred for a romantic comedy for example. We also believe very strongly that embracing creativity is crucial for accessibility. I think not everyone realises that uh, accessibility can be incredibly creative. I am very fortunate to sit in loads of productions that um, in which I'm involved as part of a an advisory team or a part, part of the creative team to give advice on accessibility. And when we really start talking about accessibility as an integrated process, we come up with fantastic ideas that improves the shows and the productions for, for everyone. And as hinted in the um, in the introduction to the talk, is about uh, the Enhancing Audio Description project is about harnessing the power of sound design we get enormous information and enjoyment from sound. That could be in terms of setting the mood, telling us what genre we're watching, when we have to be nervous, when we can be relaxed. It tells us what characters are doing and it can be fully immersive. If we think about, the, if we go to the cinema, we can see the boundaries of the screen, but we can't see the boundaries of sound because one could argue they're there aren't any um, and it is sound that takes us away from what's in the screen and allows us to expand that uh, cinematic world or, or television world. So this is these are some of the important concepts that we're looking into. So we move on to uh, the next slide. We'll, um, we'll focus a little bit on the projects. So what is the aim of uh, enhanced audio description? That is how we call the methods that are, um, are the outcome of our project. Well, the aim is to reduce reduce verbal descriptions and focus on sound design as an accessibility method. And why reduce verbal descriptions? You may have noticed in the example of um, audio description that by introducing a verbal layer that is in addition to a finished soundtrack, it's impossible not to start masking elements that are in the original soundtrack. Audio description guidelines ask descri describers to avoid uh, overlap with dialogue, 
but they have to overlap with something. Otherwise, it's, it's impossible to produce um, a, a, an audio description track. And generally what happens is when audio description comes in, uh, this original soundtrack will be ducked. That means it's going to be reduced in levels. Then when the audio description line finishes, it's going to go up again, etc., which can, of course, cause audibility problems. So there is a potential clash within these two audio streams, and that's why the enhanced, uh, the enhanced audio description method seeks to, um, to reduce verbal descriptions and incorporate accessibility as integral to the sound design strategy. And I would like to uh, highlight that, of course, although I'm, I'm presenting the methods and giving this talk today, and um, as Ben mentioned, I'm the principal investigator of this project. I, of course, don't work uh, alone, and I am really fortunate and honoured to work with a fabulous team. Um, and um, the co-investigator for this project is um, Dr. Gavin Carney, and we have two postdoctoral uh, researchers as well working with us, and those are Christian Hofstadter and uh, Michael McLaughlin. And on top of that, we're very, very fortunate to have a fantastic project officer um, that is uh, Becky Shaw. So we do work together in uh, creating these methods and uh, polishing these methods and um, testing them as well. So this is the overall aim, but what exactly is enhanced audio description? And in the next slide, we have um, a graph that hopefully um, I, I will take you through. And just so that you know, um, and I forgot to say this at the start, but everything that's on screen, I'm saying verbally and explaining verbally uh, for accessibility uh, reasons. So what we have here is a depiction of what the EAD methods are, and they're a combination of sound effects binaural audio and iVoice. And these three things together are what we call EAD methods. But what does this actually mean? Well, sound effects, that's quite general. All the films we watch have sound effects. But what we're looking at here is how those sound effects can be crucial and are crucial for accessibility. That could be uh, that in a production, for example, um, a sound effect becomes a bit buried under audio layers and this may not be too sighted audience, audiences may not notice it because they can see the sounding object potentially but when you don't see it you need to be able to hear it clearly it needs to be emphasized so this is one of the things we um, consider when we uh, work with sound effects as accessibility Another really important thing is thinking about any scenes in which maybe all the sound effects have been stripped because of an aesthetic decision. And this could be the case of mus um, music based montages where everything is a musical score and loads of um, fast cut visuals. In those cases, we also explore how we can bring back sound effects to make them accessible. And another really important thing is the establishing of the presence and the feelings and emotions of characters through sound effects. And in particularly here, I'm thinking about breathing. Breathing can tell us a lot about how a character is feeling, what they might uh, just done or what they're about to do. And very importantly, when you can't see them on screen, they establish their presence. If we can't hear a character at all, it might seem like uh, they have disappeared. Another important method that we use is, is based on binaural audio. So I'm not going to get into the technicalities of binaural audio, but, but in very simple terms, binaural audio is 3D audio through headphones. What this means is that we don't just convey left and right, we convey front and back and a height component and hopefully everything between those points as well. Why is this important to accessibility? It is actually one of the most important things uh, we do in terms of analysing how we can mix an accessible soundtrack. And it focuses on using sound to tell audiences where characters are and where they're moving to and from, and also do the same with sounding objects. So for example, if a character is in a certain point of the room in front of the listener and then walks out, um, chose the back of a space, then we would hear, for example, the footsteps of that character move in that direction. This, for example, negates the need of what we've just heard in the audio described version of Pearl, whether they tell the describer tells us 
um, about the movement of these characters, because in a way we can hear that movement, so we require less contextualization. The accessibility is there, it's just not verbal accessibility. Uh, another thing that we do is work with dialogue, and this is how we um, are a bit more different than uh, most traditional mixing uh, techniques we see in film and television. So in film and TV, the traditional uh, mixing technique is to always have dialogue at the center. This is so that there is not a disassociation between what we see on the screen and sound coming from different places, just because dialogue is always considered the most important thing, because we tend to focus more on verbal audio than other uh, elements. But we break away from that convention and we actually move the dialogue around because moving the dialogue around creates a sense of movement of the character when it's appropriate, of course. It also creates a separation between characters. For example, in the example we watched, we have um, Margaret's mum towards the left and we have the doctor towards the right. We need to, in some way, tell visually impaired audiences that they are in that position, but we don't have to describe that position because we can pan the dialogue so that that's where their voices are coming from. Another method we use, the third method we use, is what we call eye voice, which is um, a concept taken from uh, Michel Chion, but in very simple terms, is first person narration. There are certain things in a production that cannot really be conveyed through sound effects or binaural audio. This could be, um, for example, information and in specific gestures, or um, it could be there's an action that is quite different to what one would expect, and we don't want that to be inaccessible. So in those cases, we use first person narration so that the main character or characters can provide a description. This creates a very um, poetic version of a, of a description and a little bit, it sounds a bit more insightful, one could describe it in that, in that way. And it is processed with a little bit of reverberation so that it can be easily differentiated uh, from the, any main dialogue or monologue that might be in the production. So these three methods combined, sound effects, binaural audio and eye voice, is what comes together to form the EAD methods. Um, at this stage, all our pieces are in binaural audio, which I mentioned requires headphones. So what is really important is that now, if you have a pair of headphones nearby, <laughs> you grab them and connect them to uh, the device you're using to watch this, um, this talk, so that you can experience the example with the spatialization. If you listen to it over loudspeakers, you might hear a little bit of movement, but it won't be as pronounced or accurate. So if you have a chance to plug in headphones, please, please do. I'm not doing it because I don't want to upset the settings of the meeting. But uh, let's move on then now, when you all have your headphones, to uh, the next clip. So this is exactly the same than the previous clip, but with EAD. So we could play, uh, pl play the video, please. He listens with his stethoscope. He is shocked at what he hears. I'm going to get better, aren't I? You're a tough girl, Margaret. I think you'll be fine. Excuse me. I don't want him to leave. So, I offer him a pearl. When did you take this? It's all right. These are not to give away. A word, Miss Grimshaw. Now, please. I'll just take you through what's going to happen. You're going to go upstairs and pack Margaret a bag while I call an ambulance. I think not. Margaret doesn't want that and I'm not going to force her. So hope, hopefully that gave you a, a sense of what 
enhanced audio description sounds like. So it's quite different from the um, audio description strategy we listened to. So there is no indication of any positions of the characters or uh, not specific objects in the scene because those are uh, are conveyed through uh, the soundscape. So we're going to move on to the next slide, if that's OK. So uh, I'll talk about the results in a little bit, but I, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of what the precedents for this work are and a little bit about the ethos of the project. What we're working in here is the field of integrated access. So integrated access in, in, in very simple explanation is the integration of accessibility to a production. So rather than doing what uh, in most cases we see now is that something gets completed and then we worry about the accessibility. What we do in integrated access is think about the accessibility from the start of the project or as early as possible in a project cycle. And this is often associated, uh, the use of integrated access with discussions around objectivity and subjectivity in access and what uh, as accessibility experts or what audio describers should be providing. I, I want this is quite a huge topic, uh, but uh, but to to state it succinctly, we don't. Um, our ethos in the project is that we don't believe in objectivity in accessibility. Um, audio description isn't uh, an objective act. Providing audio description isn't an objective act because by the time I mean, there is a film that is mediated by a person to reach and end user. So by the time we have a mediator, it's not objective. And when we experience something, we bring our own um, lived experiences and preferences to uh, the mix. So we can never be truly objective. And that's that's absolutely fine. Uh, the audio describer is making decisions. They're they're deciding what to describe and they're making the decisions of in a way where the gaze, so to speak, of the person should be directed at. Uh, so what we do here in a way is uh, one could argue is a little bit more evident um, that there is a creative intervention. But what we're doing and a lot of projects in integrated access do is embrace, as we said before, that creativity of access and work closely with creators to um, have a version of their production that is accessible while also uh, following uh, their uh, their concepts for that piece. If you'd like to learn more about the field of integrated access, I would uh, highly recommend work by Amelia Cavallo in the field of theatre, but also Deborah Fels's work, uh, Louise Fryer's and uh, John Patrick Udo's work have all been uh, very influential uh, as we've uh, come up with the concepts behind um, EAD. So we have another slide with a bit more uh, concepts on accessibility. The next uh, concept that really roots our work uh, and it's very similar in a way is accessible filmmaking. So accessible filmmaking is the introduction of accessibility again to uh, the very early processes of filmmaking. And this is considered to be very, very important because for visually impaired people, uh, for visually impaired people, one could argue that the audio description or the accessibility layer is just as important as the cinematography, the sound design, the directing, the performances, the props, etc. So by integrating it to, uh, to the filmmaking process, we embrace the importance of accessibility while also making it um, fit the production itself. As we said before, be uh, true to the uh, concepts of the filmmakers and uh, also ensure quality. So we talked before about problems of quality. This could be a way of uh, ensuring a higher quality of audio description and work to look at uh, in this field uh, definitely would be uh, Kate Dangerfield's work and Pablo Romero Fresco has done some amazing work in this field and pioneered a lot of this um, this uh, work on accessible filmmaking. So we have a few more uh, concepts in the following slide. 
So the next one is one that you might be more familiar with, and it's the concept of universal design. But again, these concepts are very, very, very similar. And universal design is the sense that we should uh, design products, design experiences, so that they're as accessible as possible for everyone. And when we make uh, products accessible or experiences accessible, universal design tells us that we end up benefiting many more people than we thought we would. And a very typical example, which I'm going to again use because uh, it's um, I think it's, it's very representative of the concept is the idea of a ramp. Ramps are in buildings for wheelchair users. But if you arrive at, uh, say, the station at a train station with this really, really heavy uh, um, luggage and you have a ramp and you have some steps next to the ramp, you're probably going to take the ramp because it makes it easier for you to uh, to access the train station. That ramp is not there for your luggage, but by having it there, it has created advantages for many more people than anticipated. And this happens with all forms of accessibility. We may do audio, we may provide audio description or EAD for visually impaired people, but that doesn't mean that others cannot be benefiting from it and might find it enjoyable as well. A really important also, uh, and a really important uh, thing that universal design also teaches us is that when you incorporate accessibility to the creative process of making something, it actually ends up being more aesthetically pleasing and it ends up being cheaper and something I get asked quite a lot in the project is does this cost money is this expensive is EAD expensive and research shows us that if you think about it as you're making the production it's actually going to be cheaper than if you only remember accessibility once you've finished so something to think about another really important um, uh, kind of something that's really important for a project and is I'd say the key ethos of our project is uh, the importance of the end user. So in the next slide uh, there is a photo that um, shows one of our um, focus groups. So I'm not sure if the slide is available, thank you. Um, there is uh, this is a focus group we did quite a few years ago and the image shows um, myself uh, standing in front of a small auditorium and there is a slide that has um, the word Pearl um, that is the low and it shows the logo of the film and we can see from the back um, a number of people and some snacks as well, although I don't remember there being cheese, unfortunately. Um, and this is just uh, an example of the sort of work we do and that puts the end user at the centre. We try to avoid. Oh, I mean, we I, I personally feel that and that team feel we should avoid um, a way of working in which visually impaired people only provide feedback. So we don't do that. What we do is we involve people in um, pitching ideas, how they would feel about different techniques, how would they use them in certain contexts. Then we take our methods and their and their opinions into consideration in a design process. And then once we have something designed, such as Feral, we play uh, this again in testing sessions and focus groups, and that allows us to gauge um, the success of the methods. And then with that additional feedback, we do a final tweak. Um, end users are the most important part of the project. Um, when I give talks uh, to students, uh, especially students working in engineering fields, that happen to be working in accessibility. Something I always say is that it's important to remember that the most important person in the project isn't the researcher. The most important person in the project is the end user. And we shouldn't forget about that because when we forget about that, we end up uh, sadly with instances in which a lot of very cool technology is created, but actually it cannot be used by the end user because the end user hasn't been consulted. So it's very important that we, I think that we are always creating uh, products in the field of accessibility experiences that involve end users and that take on board their needs, expectations and preferences. So we're going to move on to uh, the next slide. Um, 
some I'm, I'm going to move on to this uh, in a second, but uh, a little bit of a summary of the results. If you're sitting there wondering, yes, but did this work? <laughs> Does this work? We're doing a second project, so you may have gathered it did the first project worked well. And we uh, when we tested our methods with visually impaired people, we found that EAD is found to be as accessible, engaging and informative as traditional audio description. And I I always th that phrase as is actually quite important because it didn't score higher and it didn't score lower. It scored more or less the same. And um, I always when I say this, I imagine people sitting there and thinking, well, she probably wanted to score better. And well, yes, of, co of course I did. <laughs> um, but um, I am really, really happy with these results because the reality is that when we do testing sessions and we test something new, we're asking people in a very, very brief period of time to get used to a new accessibility method after they've been using a different one for sometimes decades. So they sit down and experience something completely new. And there is a period of familiarization that happens with anything that we experience that is new. And the fact that uh, EAD scored so highly when they only experienced it once, it's incredibly uh, promising. And it tells us that with more familiarization and um, um, longer development of the techniques, we will see an even um, higher acceptance rate. Another thing that we also uh, did uh, is work with um, filmmakers to see how these methods are um, can be incorporated to uh, a team working on a film and what sort of guidelines are needed and what worked and what didn't. So what we did a few years back is we hired a group of um, film uh, students um, to provide them a realist with a realistic experience. They had to uh, apply and then be interviewed and then we assigned them a role based on their expertise. And someone in the group, um, the writer, pitched ideas uh, for the production, which th were then voted by um, their um, colleagues and uh, myself and Gavin Kearney. And the students more or less independently worked on a short film called Shelf Life. Our role as researchers were, was that of executive producers. We didn't have, uh, we didn't want to have a say on the creative uh, content of the film, uh, but of course we were there if it was, if, if we were needed. Um, mostly because of the budget, really. Those are the sort of questions I, I got. Um, but the idea was that they had to implement EAD methods from the start. So they had to think about it from the start and they had to navigate these methods. And we ended up with a short um, film. And on the screen, we have the poster of the film that says shelf life and has a tagline uh, that says humanity has an expiry date. And the central image is that of a knife with a blade that is divided into half a kind of veins and the other half a circuit board. As you may get a sense, I don't seem to work in very jolly, jolly films for some reason. So maybe the next thing we do should be uh, a comedy. So what we're going to do now is watch a very short extract of uh, this film. Show yourself. I step forward, my arms raised in surrender. The father gives me a look that dampens my hopes of staying here. Please, I'm frozen. I just came here for shelter. I didn't know it was occupied. So why don't I believe you? Nathan here knows. Why don't I believe in Nathan? Nathan's eyes are haunted. So that was an extract from Shelf Life, and it was a very, very interesting process to go through, uh, exploring how students interpreted the guidelines and what they did with them. And um, they did a fantastic job completing the film. And what you heard there, of course, is the example that has the EAD method in. Um, what we found is that, and, and it was very interesting, that um, when left with the guidelines in a very basic format, the students uh, kind of, without noticing, were more inclined to over rely on that first person description 
rather than on binaural audio techniques or sound effects. And this is not that surprising really because uh, we tend to be drawn to the voice and in a way it would echo a lot of the experiences that they may have heard uh, in terms of accessibility. And that was interesting to us because in terms of our methods, the first person narration is always the last thing we consider because of our uh, desire to reduce verbal descriptions. We always consider audio spatialization and sound effects first, and then we explore uh, first person narration last. So it was quite interesting to see how there was a need uh, on our side to, um, to express this in a more clear way so that we uh, wouldn't end up with that uh, many descriptions. Another interesting thing we found out through the first part of the project, and it was uh, a main um, area of inquiry for us, is the use of uh, our methods as a form of social inclusion. So throughout the years, we have heard a lot of visually impaired people say that um, audio description, the use of audio description can sometimes cause uh, a sense of being left out from experiences or people being annoyed at others. And this could be uh, because at home people don't want to, people they live with don't want to have to watch audio description if they don't need it. Or it could uh, be, and this I've heard this uh, story from different participants throughout the year, years, uh, say going to a cinema, putting on a headset for audio description, because that's how it's transmitted. And the person next to them at the cinema saying, oh, could you turn your headset down because you're bothering me? And of course, that headset is transmitting the audio description track without which that person won't be able to access the film. So, of course, there's a lot of need for education here, uh, and it's possible that that person that made those people that make those, those comments don't know what the headphones are for. Um, but of course, for the person experiencing that, and as it was communicated uh, to myself by different participants, it uh, leaves them with a sense of being left out and a non-inclusive non environment. So something that we did as part of the project is explore how EAD methods could be a vehicle towards social inclusion, because it's a more creative, um, potentially non-intrusive form of accessibility uh, in the sense that people may not notice it's there. And this is something we've heard from participants, that they knew it was accessible and they could feel it was accessible, but they had forgotten it was accessible. Uh, These methods can therefore um, have a higher acceptance by sighted people, which reduces this, forge, this very unfortunate encounters people have told us about. So we did run a focus group with a mixed uh, audience of uh, visually impaired people and sighted people uh, to see how that worked. And it was really interesting because visually impaired people commented that they felt it was a much more inclusive environment and that they could relax because they weren't they weren't thinking about what the person next to them thought because everybody was wearing headphones. And this is one of the reasons why at the start of the project we chose to use binaural audio so that we can make the most of the fact that the audio description experience in the cinema is already a headphone based experience. So visually impaired people felt more included and at the same time sighted people really enjoyed the experience and they felt it was something that they liked watching and they would like to watch in the future. So that was a really uh, a, a, another really interesting finding of our work. So we're going to move to uh, to the next slide. And this is focused on what you can do now. Of course, I, I don't know who's listening to this talk, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of you worked in the creative sector and you're wondering where you're listening to this, how you can make your work more accessible. Um, one of the things you can do is very simple, uh, but complex at the same time, and it's to plan and review your work critically. Think about who you're imagining your audience to be when you're creating your work, and this could be all sorts of work and why that is and how you can break away from that form of thinking and open up yourself to um, the possibility that you might be more creative when you think in that way. Something I hear a lot, this is um, a lot of the people that come to my talks are sound designers and I have heard from a few of them um, in the past that they have found 
listening to about to this methods and then going back to their practice and thinking, oh, maybe I could do this differently has opened up new avenues for design. In my personal experience, having to work on EAD has made us really think differently on what we do and has challenged our uh, design process. Another thing you can do is if you're working on a production um, in terms of film or television and you'd like to collaborate with us, please, please do get in touch. There's going to be contact details at, in the very, very last slide. Uh, we are currently looking for productions to collaborate with. So if you feel your production, you would benefit from your production having EAD methods and would like to work with us, please, please do get in touch. So we're going to move on to the next slide to see what is next. So what I presented so far, a, a lot of it is based on the work that has already been done and was funded as part of the first project. But what are we working on now? Uh, a really important thing is to explore the techniques further. So we had a, a very, very good level of success, but we know we can do better and we know some things ha went underexplored. So everything we're looking at in this project, and this is really, really important, is based on things visually impaired people that came to the sessions said they were interested in us doing. So we didn't just choose things randomly that we were interested in, but we thought about what the feedback provided was, and we used that as a basis for our research questions. One of them is about, one of those questions we're exploring is about cinematographic elements. So how can we convey things that are intrinsically visual, uh, camera shots, so types of shots, high angle, low angle, panning shots with a camera. How can we do that without describing these uh, elements, which would not be very meaningful for many people and would add verbal descriptions? So how can we do this in a sound design approach? Another thing we're looking at is genre and the impact genre has on these methods. So as I've noted before, I, I seem to have ended up working in two productions that are similar in, in a way, um, quite dark themes, um, small casts, this may have to do with the fact that they're both produced by students, um, and either sci-fi or, um, or kind of dark, sort of dark fantasy. Uh, and something people that came to the session asked us is, well, we would like to know how this works in action films, romantic comedies, etc. So this is something we're going to be exploring. And the same with cast sizes. What happens when we increase uh, the number of cast members, does the first person narration stay in the main character or does it uh, change as the story goes along? What happens with ensemble films, etc. So loads of things to explore there. Another thing we also want to do is to transfer our methods and the success we've had with binaural audio to loudspeaker based systems. That's because although binaural audio is great for uh, mobile devices, that people might be using and for cinema contexts is not that useful if someone just wants to sit down with their family to watch a film in the living room. So loudspe loudspeaker based systems are more useful in that sense. So we're trying to we're, we're trying and, and hopefully succeeding in exploring this transfer of techniques. And there's a few more things we're doing in the next slide as well. In terms of working with the film and television industries, so this project is a project in which we really don't want, um, it's not a laboratory experiment. We don't get into the studio, test some things and hope they work. And that's the end of it. We want our methods to be broadcasted. We want our methods to be in the cinema and we want our methods to be in live streamed programming. Uh, sorry, in streamed programming, oh, maybe live streamed as well. Um, and to do that, we need to work with the film and television industries closely to make sure that the way we implement the methods is, uh, is achievable, makes them achievable. So to do that, we have assembled a project advisory panel. Um, the information about everyone in the panel uh, is on the website, but to give you a, a little bit of an insight, this includes um, the, B uh, the BBC, includes ITV, includes Dolby, RNIB, campsite and many professionals in the film and television industries from writers to directors to sound designers, location sound um, experts, editors, etc. So really representatives from different roles in the industries. Another thing we're doing is working on professional productions. 
Uh, it was really insightful uh, and interesting to work on student productions, but they have limitations in the sense that they tend to, to have some similar characteristics. So we're now working on professional productions and professional productions have different characteristics that pose challenges to uh, the methods, including documentary film. While we're doing this work with the advisory board and the professional productions, we're authoring guidelines on the implementation of these methods to professional productions and looking into developing a training program for the industry. And of course, this project is a four year project, so we're not going to uh, do any of this, finish any of this by this year, but we have four years to explore it. And we have a few more things um, to explore in the next slide, and that has to do with working with um, object based systems. So in very uh, in a very short explanation, um, object based broadcasting is a system by which you can organize a production in objects that can be assembled at the end user stage. So what that could mean is that you can adapt a program to be of different lengths. Uh, or you could, for example, um, make it available with different accessibility methods. So audio description and enhanced audio description. Uh, you could even uh, allow the user to change the balance of audio elements. So sometimes you feel the music is too loud. Maybe you can drop the level of the music to allow you to access the other layers of the soundtrack uh, in a different way. So this is what object based broadcasting allows us. Uh, to do. And it's worth emphasizing that the idea with EAD, as I mentioned at the start, is to provide an alternative to audio description. It's not to replace audio description. Audio description is an incredibly valuable um, accessibility layer, and I think there should be more provided and of a higher quality. What we're doing here is offering the user through this method what they'd like to, um, to engage with and when they'd like to engage with something or the other. So it could well be that there is a scenario where for an action film, maybe um, the end user prefers a traditional audio description track and for a romantic comedy or documentary, they prefer an EAD track. So allowing that uh, optionality means that the end user can start making a choice and we have a diversity of methods we are uh, we are accessing and in a way uh, as someone um, recently mentioned by having more accessibility projects and having more work done of a higher quality it also pushes standards because it brings accessibility to the forefront uh, for creatives for broadcasters for production companies and last but not least in the next slide um, we are keen on providing uh, opportunities for students. So students today are people that in the future are going to be working and taking a career path. And we would like to make sure that film and television students and audio students know that accessibility is a path within the creative industries that they can take if they wish to. So by doing talks and engaging with students, we provide uh, hopefully an opening up of um, options to them. Um, traditionally speaking, film and television degrees do not uh, teach accessibility, so many students would be unaware that this is something that they can go into. Something we're doing to help this aim is provide internships to students. Uh, some of those internships will be with project um, partners, so members of the project advisory panel, and uh, others are going to be uh, with um, with our, our team, the enhanced audio, enhancing audio description team, and uh, we will have internships with RNIB as well in the field of audio description. And all the findings from the internships at the same time that they um, benefit the student, they also benefit the project by looking as to how that learning path happens, but also what their findings are in their internships. Those internships will be available, um, I'm afraid, only for University of York, um, York students, just in case anyone is wondering. And we're going to move to the last slide, I believe. And it's just uh, to thank you really for listening and hope you found this, uh, this talk useful and uh, um, has introduced new ways of thinking about accessibility. Uh, there's uh, a little bit of contact information on the slide uh, and my email address is uh, mariana.lopez at york.ac.uk 
and uh, I use a lot Twitter to advertise my research. So that's in terms of social media platforms. That's where you can find most of the updates. And the Twitter handle is at Mariana underscore J underscore Lopez. And if you want a place where all this is included, is included and much more, you can visit enhancingaudiodescription.com. Uh, and there's a lot of information there on the project and you can access uh, a lot of material, a blog post, videos and a podcast. So thank you so much for, uh, for listening and I'd be delighted to take some questions if there are any. Thanks, Mariana. Wonderful presentation, really exciting, interesting topic. Um, yeah, this only came across my radar because of the first the first project. And yeah, really inspired by it. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, just a reminder to everybody that's that's listening is we're using Slido for questions. So if you go to slido.com and enter the code LBU-ML, all in capitals, uh, you can throw us some questions. Uh, we have a few already, which um, some of which I think you've maybe answered, but we'll we'll throw them out there as kind of talking points um, anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, a question from Denise as to uh, whether EAD would eliminate spoken AD, which is something you talked about towards the mm. end in terms of mm. still having those traditional options open. Uh, so maybe uh, explore that a little bit. Yeah, that's that's something that that I'm at, we're asked a lot and um, that, that's why I always part of the talk like to emphasize uh, the importance of body description being produced and I, I really think it's very important that more of it is is produced and there's uh, audio description is in, in many ways is it, it well one could argue that for many people it will be better than EAD because some people might um, enjoy those verbal descriptions and uh, in our testing sessions we found uh, Again, it very much depends on the individual what uh, a person prefers. So some people have told us um, that they really enjoy costume descriptions, for example, or set descriptions. And this is something that we don't do uh, in EAD. Um, we would do it if it would prove to be uh, crucial to, to the story. So it has a really, really important uh, place uh, in production. So absolutely, I think if we if we did that, we would be actually doing the opposite of what we want to do, that we would be eliminating choice again. <laughs> so um, no, the plan has always been to uh, offer something alongside uh, and, and, you know, respecting the fact that yeah, yeah, different people have different access needs and, and aesthetically uh, people prefer different things. So offering them, you know, I would envision something as you know, simple as a button that you press and allows you to uh, to change uh, the accessibility method you're using. And I know the button thing sounds silly, but it's actually really important because so something I hear a lot is how difficult it is to switch on audio description. <laughs> um, so menus not being accessible, which means that you can't get to the accessibility layer because you can't access the menu. Um, and um, that is another thing that needs to look be looked into. It has to be really easy for someone to be able to switch within uh, between uh, methods. Uh, and again, it might be that you even want to switch in the middle of a of a film and see what it feels like uh, to experience it in a mixed way. So that that would be interesting. So I hope that answers the question. Um, a kind of related question from Dave and, and something that you you probably touched on as well. Uh, do you feel a EAD is something which would be agreeable to a mainstream audience without distracting them from the film? And I, I, I personally really enjoy the eye voice element. I feel it mm. really draws you into a character and as a, you know, as a non uh, hearing impaired, uh, visually impaired listener, that appeals to me and it gives me a bit more of a character. So. It seems that you you are providing something which would be agreeable to to all listeners and watchers. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is what was really interesting about the mixed focus groups, uh, because uh, sighted people seem to really enjoy um, the the production. And uh, at first, we had a few concerns as to the panning of the dialogue because of how it's designed and to avoid confusing um, the listener, uh, there's there might sometimes be a positioning of the dialogue that if you're seeing the screen might not be what you would you would expect to hear. And we had some worries as to whether people would would find the panning of the dialogue a bit um, 
bit too different from their experiences. But actually, that wasn't the case at all. Um, if I'm honest, not even I remember the focus group. Um, nobody even mentioned it. And, and I remember my colleague Gavin uh, Carney did ask the question because he was quite keen on, on knowing. But the answer was that no, they didn't seem to. It wasn't a concern at all. And um, the funny thing is that the uh, students did uh, the, did the sound for the original sound for uh, Pearl. Um, they came to one of the uh, the screenings at, at it was a Tate um, Tate Britain uh, a few years ago. And after they watched it, they said they preferred our version than the one they did. Um, so uh, definitely, I think um, there is a lot of appeal. And again, it could be something the same that we were talking with Universal Design that it ends up being better for certain um, for, for wider audiences that would like to experience films in a certain in a certain way. So definitely mm. and as, as you kind of into that, it does require a, a new way of thinking, a, a, a yeah. new approach and, and how you I guess one of the challenges there is how you integrate the eye voice yeah. with the dialogue, with the narrative. And that involves a very, you know, a t team based approach, yeah. um, certainly from filmmakers, uh, which is, is going to require a shift in, in working styles and patterns, I would yeah. guess, and approaches. Yeah, something something we learned when we did Shelf Life was our first approach was to ask the writer to write the eye voice at the same time that she was writing the script because we felt well that, you know, integrated access, that's what we should do. And then we realized uh, through through her, her her feedback that that was that was a bad idea <laughs> um, because, of course, when the film was edited, they changed things and everything she had written be became a little bit uh, obsolete and she had to rewrite the eye voice. And that's something that we, we really learned from that process, that what we felt was the right way of doing integrated access in that particular element, it actually produced more work and, and slight, you know, potentially could frustrate someone if they feel, you know, They've been paid to do something and now they're having to rewrite stuff. Um, so yes, some some workflows don't, you know, not every everything needs to be done at the start. It's a question, as you say, to rethinking how that works. And it's part of those guidelines we're we're working on. Uh, that kind of raises a, a, a talking point for me, I guess, is in terms of the, the research approach or your methodology is quite complex in terms of getting the information that you need. Obviously, using focus groups quite a lot, you're talking to people a lot. You know, how do you get the information that you need? How do you, what sort of things are you asking in focus groups? How are you quantifying some of those responses? How are you using that to inform, you know, the statement that the, the scores for AD and EAD are the same, you know, what what is what contributes towards that score? Yeah, so um, we haven't started any um, audience work yet uh, in this project because we're still kind of working our, our frameworks and, and design examples. Uh, in the past, we, we've used a variety of methods. Um, at the very start of enhancing audio description back in 2016, uh, we started by doing a survey, uh, a quite um, uh, quite a large survey in which we really were interested in into lo in looking at um, a, you know attitudes towards audio description in the UK, what people like, what they didn't like, um, and how they felt uh, about specific aspects such as social inclusion, uh, and uh, how they felt about having different options to uh, accessibility, and and it was really interesting because. Um, sometimes um, throughout the survey and the analysis, uh, there is the sense that uh, people were open to the idea of alternatives, but they just didn't think it was going to happen because if audio description is barely being provided, then it doesn't give you much hope that there's going to be an investment. And um, I, th I think that is something that resonated and, and kind of reinforces the need for this research and to push for availability. Yeah, can I just jump in there? Yeah, that yeah, relates to a, to a question from Denise. Is, um, that's, is, is the small percentage of AD due to a uh, lack of skill des describers or or something else? Just, should, you know, cost, time, those sorts of things. That's an interesting question. And, and I think there, there's, there, I, I, I would argue that there's people that are, uh, that have more expertise on this than I do. Um, my feeling and, and the things I've heard from people, there is a cost factor or a perceived 
maybe a perceived cost factor. This is definitely something that visually impaired people have commented on that it has to them. It has to do with cost. Uh, I would say that um, it has to do with attitudes as well. Uh, I remember a focus group. Someone, um, it's one of the pap it's one of the papers we published because I thought it was such a such a meaningful uh, contribution. Um, a participant commented on how you know years ago, very very many years ago, people you know they had to build accessible toilets, and it was like it was the end of the world. How how where where is the space going to come to? Why do I have to have this ramp? And now, I mean, it would be pretty shocking if you went to a to building and there's no accessible toilet or there's not a ramp and you can't get into the building. I mean, I know there's places that still have those problems or they have an accessible toilet in the first floor and you can't get to it, um, which all I've also heard that can happen. Um, but if you're building something new, you kind of, I think, would take it as a given. You would try to provide that. But that's not how people think about audio description, I don't think. Um, I um, I supervise a lot of student film projects and it's very rare for students to say, oh, well, what about our films being accessible? Um, and you can even sometimes find out that students um, have relatives that are visually impaired that themselves can't access the student's film. and. Professionals the same. This I don't think everybody thinks. Well, what if a blind person comes to my screening? What are they going to get? Do people even check the audio described versions of their films? I have to say I don't have any data on this, but I get a very strong feeling that they're not checking the audio described versions of uh, their film, which is interesting because film is such a controlled medium and what goes to uh, goes into the accessibility uh, layer seems to be relegated because it's not cinematography and it's not sound design. So I think a, a question of costs or perceived cost versus attitudes. I think if you change the way people think about something and people start seeing the value in it, then it's no longer a problem because they can budget for it. <laughs> um, and this is a lot of the work we do. It's 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 about the methods, but I would argue our project is about much more than that. It's about engaging creatives to the point in which they think about accessibility and they want it. They want this in their projects. And that is not just good for EAD, but it means that they will also think about audio description and hopefully that will boost quantity and quality. So that was a really long answer to your question. <laughs> it's, it's a good one. In, interestingly, uh, Alice has just commented that uh, she's an audio describer and there are lots of TV companies hiring at the moment. So cool, that there kind you go. of bodes well yeah. for the fact it's maybe being taken a bit more seriously and and the, the more opportunities yeah. there. And, and I think something to, to add on uh, to that is, you know, audio description is a profession and it's incredibly uh, challenging and, 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 you know, people study these fields and specialize in these fields. And the reason it must seem strange that I'm mentioning this, but I think accessibility sometimes is treated as something that, you know, you just describe something a little bit and you tick the box. And I've definitely seen this in universities where suddenly lecturers turn into captioners and they turn into audio describers. And you think, yes, but that person has, you know, a PhD in architecture, uh, surely they're not a professional captioner and they're not a professional audio describer. So I think it's very important to highlight that um, these are professionals and they know what they're doing and um, we need to involve them in access. So, so you know, I, I'm not, uh, for example, I'm not a professional captioner. So when we have to do captions for our videos, we, uh, we outsource them because um, they know the conventions and can do so much better job than I can. So I think it's recognizing this as true career paths and and you know, professionals. Um, and, and a little follow up from Alice as well, that I love that you're hammering home the idea that it's cheaper to factor access in from the start mm. and not pay lots at the end um, and <laughs> you know integrating that into the whole creative process. Yeah. It's kind of um, embarrassing, isn't it, for a production, you know, that they didn't like realize they needed accessibility. Just didn't even bother. <laughs> 
Um, this question here, it's an anonymous one, but it is an interesting one. Um, how do you cope with camera angles? Uh, character change from one side to the other according to which cameras you used? Um, do you keep panning? Do you make a choice in terms of where the, the voice stays and position and spatialization of things? Yeah, that's a very good question. That is a very, very big focus of the new project because it's very, very complex. Um, in the past, we have taken what one could um, call a bit of a theatrical approach where things remain stable, even if the shots change, with the exception of things that are jarring, because sometimes, you know, if, if you did a change, that means that voices are inverted, is a really real clash for a sighted person to have that change. And it's not really representative of what's on screen either. So we have used both approaches, but um, we are focusing um, on this in the new project. And uh, my colleague Christian Hofstadter is doing a lot of fantastic work looking at literature about this, uh, case studies of where this has been done uh, in uh, sound design practices, uh, etc., to see what is the best way um, of providing it. But it is a very it's a very very complex topic. Mm. It just related to that question for me in terms of of binaural, and you know, binaural is a wonderful tool, but it does have limitations. Yeah. Uh, one of them being that I heard all of that in mono. Um, oh. Potentially Microsoft Teams, potentially my headset. I know it runs okay. when I'm using it as a headset. It runs as a mono feed uh oh lower my. resolution so That's i didn't bad. get any you know, so i didn't get any of the binaural stuff there so that does happen you know in terms of broadcast um things occasionally get some to mono the stereo stuff gets gets lost that's one yeah. problem with binaural yeah. the other issue i guess uh, which links into some other research at york is the fact that you're always listening through somebody else's ears yes. um and that is often a, a, a dummy head a mannequin of some description you're listening with, with somebody else's head and that doesn't always work for everybody um so there's obviously work going on at york as well in terms of yeah. sadie projects yeah. and and, and personalizing binaural experiences do you want to maybe expand on that a little bit yeah so you're, you're absolutely right there's challenges and, and by the way if, if people did hear that in mono and uh, i always find that people think oh my god there's something wrong with with me and i can't hear it um it's probably because sometimes um uh, things like Teams and Zoom have a little setting that that needs to be clicked. I, I think I know Zoom. You have to say that it has to be stereo. Um, so if you did have that problem, uh, if you go to the Enhancing Audio Description website, uh, there's links to the films there, uh, and those I'm sure uh, will play correctly. So uh, so do, uh, apologies if that was everyone's uh, experience. I swear there is binaural audio. <laughs> um, um, but this has happened uh, before, which I'm sure is, is confusing. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Binaural audio has limitations and uh, very much um, this is part of what my colleague uh, Gavin Kearney's work packages are. It's looking a little bit more binaural, but also looking at that translation to loudspeaker uh, setups where we, um, you may potentially overcome those well, you would overcome that the the idea of of yeah listening through someone else's ears, uh, but also if you're using binaural, um, which are the filters that are more successful in uh, s kind of stereo settings over loudspeakers, so that if someone does listen to the production over loudspeakers, that doesn't you know generate an awful uh, unpleasant soundtrack to listen uh, to listen to and that again is very much uh, part of um of this new project i mean something to to bear in mind as well is that you not every spatial audio system will work for everyone and i think uh, i sometimes think and this might sound a bit harsh but i think um sometimes spatial audio researchers have an expectation that people have to like their spatialization because it's so cool and it's so advanced that how how could you prefer the stereo version um and sometimes people prefer a simpler version and this could be because of many things it could be familiarization you're asking them to, to listen to something that sounds nothing like what they're used to and this um this is not something that they feel at the time that they want sometimes it has to do with experiences for spatial audio in a way being sonically immersive but not narratively immersive so to speak which uh, sometimes um, 
you know, changes what we think about an experience. I mean, if, if um, I always say that the the most impressive binaural piece I've ever experienced is um, the theatre production by Complicité of Encounter. Um, there is, I've never experienced anything like that in binaural audio, and uh, it's it's just outstanding. And and the truth is that it's it's not just because. The kind of I don't know if have you watched it, Ben? Um, I haven't. No. Yeah. Uh, suddenly it hasn't it, it hasn't um, toured for a while. But uh, this is this is a one person show. All it's, it's headphone theatre, so uh, you ex all the audience members uh, w watch the production with theatres, and um, so do look it up <laughs> afterwards. There's some short videos. But the really thing about the, the really great thing about Encounter is that it's a fascinating story um, and with wonderful performance and by Noel Audio is there enhancing that story and making you feel part of the story um, and that is the best use of spatial audio when it's really about moving audiences and telling a story. It's not about let's move a little bit of audio around because it's cool uh, and especially with accessibility it's definitely not about it because you could do really cool things that are really inaccessible. Um, it's about really generating that immersion and engagement and making sure that we're not actually disengaging the audience by doing so using certain methods. Um, so, for example, some uh, something we had in focus groups is that um, approaches to binaural audio and, and perception of binaural audio could range from I loved it, I want more of this, I want this all the time. Um, and that is so it's not just the binaural audio, it's the quality of audio as well. And uh, we've had some really nice comments of um, participants saying that it was evident that a lot of crafting and care had been put behind the methods, which is of course beautiful, beautiful uh, to hear because it is indeed true. Um, but of course we had people that found um, that when they put the headphones and they could, because binaural audio was working well and this voices sounded like they were in the room, they found it a bit confusing. And of course, um, as you know, Ben, the, the best sign of good binaural audio is when people turn around because they think there is someone in the room with them. So technically speaking, that is fantastic. But some people felt, well, there was this coughing and it was really distressing because I thought it was the person next to me. That was pre-pandemic. Now, of course, it would be very distressing. Even more so. <laughs> they would be terrible. So, you know, the, it, it, it is, Exploring different systems allows us hopefully again through um, object based broadcasting and personalization allows us to uh, let people choose. Is it binaural audio or maybe it's stereo speakers? Maybe it's 5.1, maybe it's Dolby Atmos. Mm. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I could talk all afternoon about this. Got so many more questions written down. The things you were just about to talk about, object-based personalization, how do we deliver it? But um, the, the the slide for the, the next talk in the series um, has arrived on screen and we're moving towards three o'clock. Um, so we'll wrap up the talk there. Thank you very much. Uh, very inspiring, very interesting, great answers to the questions, yeah. uh, great discussion. Um, and I think we're going to hand back to Sue uh, to close today's event. Thank you so much, um, Mariana, for a fantastic and, and really informative um, talk. And thank you, Ben, for the question and answer session, which, like uh, Ben said, could go on much longer. Um, I think I'll just kind of summarise the things that I've taken from this, that enhanced audio description is, a, is an insightful and creative approach, and it's got inclusivity and accessibility designed in it from the start or in the early stages of the, of the planning, and the inclusion of visually impaired people in the design as well as in the feedback loop that you've got going uh, ensures that it's not a top-down kind of innovation. Um, the advocacy role that, that is developing out of your projects is, is, is actually so crucial um, and so interesting. So um, I'm really hopeful that some of the things you were saying about a wider acceptance of these methods is like recently it's been documented, I think, that younger, the younger generation really like to have subtitles on film and video. And that's become, you know, people used to complain about subtitles. I've always liked foreign films, so I like them. But people used to complain about them. But now people want them. 
it's got it's it's generated that wider acceptance. So I really hope that there's a wider acceptance of enhanced audio description as you were talking about. Um, so it's been a fantastic talk. The loudspeaker based systems, the object based systems that are going to come from this. Really exciting um, and really important. So thank you very much to Mariana. Thank you very much to Ben. Thank you to the whole Inside Out team. So that includes Karen and Beth Pryor and yeah, Karen Smith, Beth Pryor, Dave Turner, Emmeline Baker, the whole team. And thanks once again to our fantastic speaker, Mariana Lopez. Thank you very much. And do join us for our next talk on Wednesday, the 11th of May from Elizabeth Price. Thank you.